So today we are honored to welcome Dr. Andrea Reed to the Lake Superior Watershed. Welcome, Andrea. Dr. Reed is a citizen of the Niska's nation and an assistant professor with the University of British Columbia and specifically in the Institute for Ocean and Fisheries. Uh, Dr. Reed uses interdisciplinary and applied approaches to improve our understanding of the complex interrelationships between fish, people, and place. I first uh, saw Dr. Reed speak, well, I believe it was 2020, at the UW-Madison Limnology Seminar and immediately um, hoped that we could secure her for this series um, and are really just, again, honored and thankful for your time here today. So earlier, a little bit more about Dr. Reed. Earlier this year, she launched the Center for Indigenous Fisheries, which is a national and international hub for the study and protection of culturally significant fish and fisheries. She also co-founded Riparia, a Canadian charity that connects diverse young women with science on the water to grow the next generation of water protectors. And Dr. Reed is also a National Geographic Explorer and a fellow of the Explorers Club. So today, um, the talk will focus on two-eyed seeing and ind indigenous knowledges and sovereignty in fisheries. And we will have time for, present, or for, the, for you all to ask questions after the presentation. And just a note on that, um, when you are considering submitting your question, we invite you to pause before you do so. Um, the reason being, often indigenous scholars and presenters are asked questions that put them in a position that requires a lot of personal and emotional labor. So to be conscious of that, we encourage your, we do encourage your questions, but we ask you to pause before you submit them. Self-evaluate if your question is appropriate for this forum. Um, and with that, I'm happy to hand it over to you, Andrea, and um, we'll get started here. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. You can hear me okay? Yep, coming in. Loud. And I'm just going to share my screen and make sure that you can see that as well before I let you unmute your, or mute yourself. <laughs> yep, looks good. I see your first slide. Perfect. Thanks so much. So neat. I'm Willa Willina. Hello. How are you? Um, as Erin introduced, my name is Andrea Reed. I'm a citizen of the Niska Nation. I'm a descendant of the Giscast or Killer Whale Clan and of the Stewart family from Gingol, just in Northern British Columbia at the base of the Alaska Panhandle. And it's my pleasure to, to be here with you today. I'm joining from the historical and contemporary territories of the Hamaskwiam, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Skohomish here in present day Vancouver. And as Erin introduced, I'm a new faculty member at UBC and assistant professor of indigenous fisheries where I'm launching our new center that I'll, I'll speak to a little bit today. But what I'm actually gonna, gonna do uh, this afternoon for you folks, this morning for me, um, is to share a lecture that I delivered as part of the Peter Cruz Memorial Lecture um, at Carleton University in 2019. The year prior, in 2018, it was delivered by Carleton's Heather Menzies, who shared her personal journey from settler to treaty person. And so in 2019, I was invited to provide a follow-up detailing my own journey from a Western-trained scientist to an Indigenous scientist, kind of continuing along that narrative. And so while today's talk will focus on fish, on people, and place, there's a lot within this that I think relates to, to other disciplines, other lines of inquiry that center on how we create space for indigenous ways of knowing and thinking and, and being, how and why we ask questions, design methodology, build knowledge on a subject and share stories. So I hope that there are elements from within this that uh, resonate well with this science communication series. So with that as my quick preface, I'll, I'll dive right in with starting by saying that there are times in life where you end up far from where you intended or where you thought you were going. I was gonna study fish, but not just any fish or Han in the Niska language. I was gonna study salmon, the fish of my people in Lisms, the Nass River, the river of my people. And I was gonna use all of the science I had learned in school and in books and in labs to understand it, dissect it, bottle it, know it. Um, what I didn't know at the time is what it would teach me, how it would 
deepen, alter, and expand my whole world view. And I told my best friend then when I first visited the River Nass as an adult, not as a child as I should have been, I told her that this place will mark me. And it did. My thinking, my thesis, my way of viewing and being in the world, one who for reasons beyond her control or that of her family grew up as far from her home community as one can without leaving the country. How I as an indigenous female fishery scientist have come to strengthen the work that I need to do, my ability to protect fish and water and all that they stand for, not by simply applying my book learning to the real world, nor by abandoning it altogether, but by bringing knowledges and ways of knowing together, seeing with both the eyes for the betterment of all for fish, people and place. This place that I speak of is the Nass River Valley, home of the Niska Nation, my nation that is right at the base of the Alaska Panhandle, as I mentioned, in northern British Columbia, where a sovereign fish-centric mountain and river people. And while I have heritage, relations, and community here now, I did not grow up in Gingolth. I'm also of Irish descent and was raised on the opposite side of the country on Prince Edward Island in a small fishing and farming community surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. This is a place originally named Ebigwit in Mi'kmaq, mean, meaning cradled on the waves. And that's, that's exactly how I grew up. And this drove into me an unending love for the beach and the ocean, for swimming, for diving, boating, snorkeling, anything and everything to do with water and all that lives inside of it. We knew some things about our indigenous roots. These are my two older brothers with our father, but we didn't grow up in ceremony. We don't speak Niska and we're only finding our way back, so to speak, as adults. And so my job today is to convince you of three things that I now hold dear as someone who has found her way back to community through science. First and foremost, it's that research does not take place in a vacuum. It is guided by assumptions about how the world is and operates. And this has impacts on how knowledge is produced, acquired, valued, and shared. Second, and this is totally unbiased, of course, fish and fisheries are an area of much needed study. And we need help from all the places that we can get as there are as they're currently under threat with far reaching social, cultural, political, economic and ecological impacts. And as a side tangent, Pacific salmon are truly fascinating creatures, but I'll get to this later. And third and last is that there's more than one worldview and no one worldview should dominate them all. We stand to gain a lot by embracing this diversity rather than shutting it out. Throughout this talk, I'll be using Powerful visual media by Métis artist Christy Belcourt. This is her painting, Offerings to Save the World. And her work is all about the interrelationships between people and place with fish and water at the heart of it all. So very well matched with a lot of my own work and messaging. And I find visual media is not only pleasing to the eye, but it's a valuable tool for us scientists and storytellers to have our audiences connect on an emotional level with the messages that we're here to share. And Christy has graciously granted me permission to include her work in, in some of my talks to help bring attention to our fish, our waters, our people, and all the ways that they intersect. And this will be interspersed with my own and my friend's photography, as you've seen so far, to help bring my work into this virtual room. So starting with number one, research does not take place in a vacuum. All scholarly research, whether explicitly stated or not, is informed by a research paradigm, which in turn informs the methodology and the methods. A paradigm is a philosophical stance or a conceptual framework, a philosophy, a worldview that informs the researcher's view of reality, what counts as knowledge and ways of knowing and guides research priorities, choices, and actions. In the more social sciences, paradigms are defined in four parts in terms of ontology, the nature of reality, epistemology, what is knowledge and the nature of it, axiology, which are our values, and methodology, the purpose and process of research. 
and I don't expect you to keep track of all these terms if you're not already familiar with them, but I'll circle back to these concepts later in this talk. Research paradigms within academia and especially within the natural sciences stem from a Western and Eurocentric tradition. Many scientists dislike the term Western science because it's their belief that science in the Western sense is universal and therein lies a major issue within the academy. How are we to accept and respect non-dominant paradigms when this is the culture? The roots of Eurocentrism in universities run extremely deep, but there's a movement afoot critiquing and resisting this dominance with indigenous scholars around the globe reclaiming their people's research methodologies and paradigms. And I'll be more than glad to, to discuss books and, and reading recommendations at the end. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada provides impetus for a new approach to collaborations between Indigenous and settler researchers and research subjects. About one quarter of the 94 calls to action put forward by the TRC are concerned with Indigenous ways of knowing as they relate to education, to teaching, law, justice, language, spirituality, and while not explicitly included, I'll later argue that fish and fisheries are deeply interconnected to many of these various facets of indigenous knowledge, ways of life, and, and ways of knowing. Indigenous knowledge systems are defined for us by Professor Emeritus Fickert Berkus at the, at the University of Manitoba as a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission about the relationship of living beings, including humans, with one another and with their environment. This is not data, this is a way of understanding and being in the world. The TRC calls on Canada to adopt the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. At first, during the Harper era, we voted it down, but finally signed it under Trudeau in 2016. And BC is now the first province um, as of late 2019 to have passed legislation to implement UNDRIP as law. Federally, it passed in the House of Commons in 2018, but then died in the Senate later that year and it's currently being revisited, but yet to become law nationwide. So there are growing reasons and even legal mandates or international expectations in some cases to do things better, for universities and researchers to decolonize, to include indigenous ways of knowing indigenous paradigms in the academy and to teach them and embrace them in research, to value them as equal to Western approaches to, to knowing and creating knowledge. But this is a lofty goal and a primary reason why my talk centers here on indigenizing rather than decolonizing. Decolonizing is a major unsettling enterprise that cannot easily be grafted onto pre-existing discourses or frameworks. It is about land, sovereignty, resources, self-determination. These are big issues. Decolonization is, a, is ultimately about emancipation from hearing only the voices of Western Europe, emancipation from generations of silence, and emancipation from seeing the world in one color. Indigenizing, on the other hand, while not my favorite term, it does get overused and it's often ill-defined. People have kind of vague ideas about putting indigenous peoples in the middle of something, but most don't actually know what it means. So let us define it here. In the context of research methodologies, I'll turn to Professor Linda Tuhiwai Smith from the University of Waikato in Aotearoa, who takes it to mean inserting indigenous principles into research methodology so that research practices can play a role in the assertion of indigenous people's rights and sovereignty. So it's not the rights and sovereignty ends per se, but it's what we do to move in this direction, which is a far easier task, I would argue, and one that we can all see through if we want to in our lifetimes. While indigenous communities around the world are hugely diverse in a multiplicity of ways, there are commonalities in worldview that we can draw across many of them. There's substantial convergence in terms of indigenous paradigms being largely rooted in the land. There's a common understanding of 
interconnectedness and interdependence, recurring tenets such as long-term perspectives, adaptation to change, commitment to the commons, and it all hinges on having a close relationship with the environment. There are certainly compatibility issues though that we have to contend with. Bringing indigenous principles into research methodologies at Western institutions, indigenous and Western approaches to science and to understanding the natural world around us could often not be more at odds. Where one is said to be holistic, the other reductionist. Where one is thought of as being interconnected, the other sees humans as separate from nature. Where one relies on an oral tradition, the other is extremely literate. And the list goes on and on. So how do we reconcile these two disparate worlds when for many Indigenous communities and peoples, research itself is a dirty word. As Indigenous peoples quickly became among the most researched human groups, natural scientists extracted natural resources for profit, social scientists studied indigenous peoples to find health solutions and inform government policy. A colonial worldview was their reference. It was exploitative. It aimed at assimilating in some cases and in others it was invasive and unethical. It wasn't done for indigenous communities, let alone by them or on their terms. So the big question now is how do we indigenize universities, science, and for me specifically, fisheries science, bringing us to, to part two of my talk centered on fish and fisheries. So we're going to pivot here for a little bit from these heavier topics. When you think about fish, you might think of them in a tank or inside of a dentist's office, maybe even on a plate likely not you know, going up a tree or living on a hydrothermal vent or walking out of water or breathing air, but they do each and every one of these things. They are truly marvelous creatures. A lot of people might think of fishermen, but not so much fisherwomen who around the world make up a large component of fisheries. On the African continent, women across many countries make up half, if not more, of the fishery sector, um, as shown by this blue line. Um, that's the percentage of women employed in, in fisheries uh, by, by country. And the pink bar is the proportion of women that make up the fish processing sector. And you can see that they frequently make up the majority, if not the entirety of that sector. You probably don't think of fish and fisheries as inextricably linked to language, to culture, to identity to identity and to laws, but they absolutely are. So I'm gonna take us in a little bit of a step back in time in the land we now call Canada. Before the arrival of European settlers for tens of thousands of years, indigenous peoples across these lands and waters relied massively on fish and fisheries from the east to the west, through the, the middle and, and to the north. And in each of these contexts, place-based knowledge systems developed tied to the fishery and context-specific fishing technologies were passed down across generations. Indigenous fishing practices were governed by laws embedded into their worldviews and into their languages, centering often on conservation for generations to come. And this is the principle of intergenerational responsibility as beautifully worded by Stalo author Lee Miracle who says, I know nothing of great mysteries, no less of creation. I do know that the farther backward in time that I travel, the more grandmothers, and farther forward, the more grandchildren. I am obligated to both. A linked concept is the Mi'kmaq notion of Nedigulimk, which describes achieving nutritional and economic standards of well-being for the community without jeopardizing the ecological integrity, diversity, or productivity of the future. Using context-specific fishing techniques involved a variety of gear types, including nets, hooks, long lines, spears, harpoons, traps, and weirs. And long before the advent of industrial fishing practices, indigenous peoples engaged in more than subsistence fishing, building fisheries-based economies that involved trade with both near and distant neighbors, even exchanges with early European settlers. But if we fast forward to 1868, one year after Canadian Confederation, 
the Fisheries Act was legislated um, in what is not by what is now known as the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada or DFO to manage and to control all fisheries, ultimately supporting the growth and expansion of non-Indigenous fisheries and imposing restrictions and often displacing Indigenous fishing practices, laws, and economies. In the next century saw Indigenous fisheries shift from being wholly self-determined to almost entirely state-controlled. However, in the late 20th century, two important Supreme Court of Canada decisions would come to pass that would alter the course of Indigenous fisheries in present-day Canada. In 1990, what was later dubbed the Sparrow Decision ruled that the Musqueam First Nation here in present-day Vancouver possessed the right to fish for food, social, and ceremonial purposes, so-called FSC fisheries, and that this right has constitutional priority um, after conservation, but before recreational and commercial harvesting activities. In 1999 came the Marshall decision where the court ruled that Donald Marshall Jr., a Mi'kmaq fisher, possessed a treaty right to engage in commercial fishing, a ruling that questioned the legal authority and management entitlement of the state over indigenous fishing practices. Today, in a supposed era of reconciliation between Canada and the Indigenous peoples of these lands and waters, and as a direct result of Indigenous activism, amendments to the Fisheries Act are explicitly inclusive of Indigenous knowledge systems and at least considerate of Indigenous treaty rights. There remains, however, a lot of uncertainty around whether future Indigenous participation in fisheries management decisions in Canada will be substantive and meaningful or purely symbolic. This is a time of increasing recognition of the critical and long-standing importance of Indigenous stewardship for biodiversity maintenance, um, for cultural preservation, which hopefully is going to steer us towards a shared future that respects Indigenous fishing practices, laws, and ceremonies. But we will see. Around the world, fisheries are being overfished threatened by pollution, devastated by dams and habitat loss and con contending with invasive species and disease so that they can continue to uphold everything that they're inextricably tied to. We need to do things better and we need to do them together. So let me back up one more time to share with you how I arrived at this work. So from, from PEI, off I went to McGill University to pursue my undergraduate in science. I adored numbers. I thought I might go into math and then I took calculus one and my life changed. But my head was turned when I realized that I could make my job being outdoors, studying animals to be like Jane Goodall. So I set off to East, East Africa in search of, of actual monkeys and I spent my days in Kibali Forest on the border of the DRC, 12, 14 hour days following monkeys around the forest, counting each time they, they ate a leaf or switched between trees until a fateful day where my advisor asked me to join his wife, a scientist in her own right and a damn good one too. And so off I went to Africa's largest lake, Lake Victoria, to spend a day studying fish and I basically never looked back. And this sent me down a path to study fish, both large and small in Uganda, in Hawaii, the, the Solomon Islands in Indonesia, the Philippines and, and many other places. Much of this in partnership and with support from the National Geographic Society. I was working with local fishers, knowledge keepers to help protect fish and their habitats across all kinds of contexts and getting my masters at McGill along the way. But then something stopped me in my tracks. A specific scholarship application came across my desk for indigenous graduate students. And it asked me how my work matters to my community how do I give back to my community? And it dawned on me that it had literally nothing to do with them. Here I am working hand in hand with people on the opposite side of the world on fisheries issues that we share here at home. So why am I not working in the Nass River Valley, home of the Niska Nation? What am I doing with my life? And so I crafted a PhD program uh, with my two prospective advisors that might bring me closer to home to study this amazing organism that makes migrations sometimes thousands of kilometers long. They're born as 
small fry and lakes, streams and creeks that turn into smolts and migrate downriver into the ocean where they eat as much as they can and get as big as they possibly can before returning to their home rivers to go back upstream to where they were born. And that is where they too will have their babies giving rise to the next generation before they die, somehow remembering where they need to be and when, thriving in both fresh and saltwater environments, contending with fisheries, dams, pollution, habitat loss, invasive species, disease, and much more as they move from the ocean back to spawning grounds feeding people, fueling culture, driving economies as they move across space and time. How many of these fish actually make it through this gauntlet of threats? That would be the focus of my dissertation, specifically honing in on these fish that get caught in fisheries and released as bycatch because they're not the target catch. And so DFO says they must be returned to the water, dead or alive. In Niska and many other indigenous cultures, what you catch is what you keep. We don't play with food or toy with fate. There are stories about this. Young boys putting sticks on fire into the backs of spawning salmon in a creek. This unleashed a volcanic eruption in our territory 400 plus years ago, Canada's most recent volcanic eruption causing the loss of 2000 Niska lives, an event that would shift the river from where it once stood further north, creating these vast lava fields now considered traditional burial grounds for all the lives below them. I thought I was coming to this place late in life, this realization I should have had in my youth only coming to me now. I felt ill-equipped to not only start working in a new place and on a new fish, but to arrive there so green to the culture, my culture, the knowledge and everything that comes with it. What I didn't realize at the time was that my positionality of being so-called divided, indigenous and white, it was not a conflict, but a strength. And I've since encountered many female indigenous writers who share this view like Tuscarora author, Alicia Elliott, who eloquently says that being both Haudenosaunee and white wasn't a curse meant to tear me in two. It was a call to uphold the different responsibilities that come with each part of me. I didn't need to worry about whether to get in the boat or the canoe, and I certainly didn't need to drown in between. Understanding and honoring my unique responsibilities was always the way to keep myself afloat. By coming back to my culture through science, I was cultivating a new way of seeing the world, a new perspective, the gift of multiple perspectives, in the words of Dr. Raven Sinclair. My research started as ecological. I was tracking salmon across this migratory journey using radio transmitters embedded with these little chips. And what I didn't mention previously is that sockeye salmon, my focal species, as they make their journey home as adults, they've just finished feasting in the productive ocean, filling their boots with krill and, and other tiny organisms, which, which give them this bright red distinctive color when they grow up and, and go upstream. So these fish are completely full and they're now gonna pour all of their energy and all of their attention into just getting home, fighting the river current um, as they work their way back upstream. They don't have time for food or other distractions and reproduction is the only goal, kind of, kind of like teenagers. And this gives us scientists a unique opportunity. See these tags fit snugly inside their bellies. So when we catch these salmon, we keep them submerged in water the whole time so that they can breathe. And we insert these tags down their throats. And this allows us to not have to do a surgical implantation or put them on the outside of their bodies, which can create drag. And all of these other alternatives tend to be more harmful to the fish. And this is now a tested and, and true technique for minimizing harm in salmon. And I was just going to share an image of what this looks like inside the fish. Um, but I wanted to give people a chance to look away if you're a little bit squeamish and don't want to see fish organs. But this was a fish that was harvested for food. And so we, we tagged it just to see where it would sit inside the fish. And we can see that it's sitting there inside its stomach. It's not touching or disrupting any of the other organs inside the fish. And we have really good survival with uh, these tags implanted. My study fish do not get cut open in this way. We release them alive and feisty to continue along their migrations. And then we use radio stations to, to listen for the fish as they migrate home and also mobile antenna setups to track opportunistically in different places. And from all this information, we can see 
how many fish made it through that gauntlet to spawning grounds like this fish versus how many didn't. Um, here you can see the, the antenna from the um, internal tag. And we also put an external tag, that green tag, um, on their, on, not near their door still fin. So fishers or whoever might catch this fish can know that we're studying it and they can report it back to us or, or let it go. And from all this, we can tell how many of those bycatch fish are, are reaching spawning grounds. How does this change if they're injured or if they're big or small, male or female? We can ask and answer all kinds of things, but not everything. This portion of my PhD research was giving me one perspective of how fisheries, how this fisheries world worked. I did this kind of work not only in the Nass River, but also in the neighboring Skeena just below, and as well as in the Fraser in the south. And these are BC's three largest and most productive salmon producing systems. I was working with local fishers like I had always done. I was heeding their advice of where and when to fish and my hypotheses were strengthened and guided by their input as well as that of community leaders and community members. I presented our work at our biannual assembly where our entire nation comes out for updates on what each department in our sovereign nation is working on like the Niska Fisheries and Wildlife Department, for instance, which has been op in operation for uh, now nearly three decades doing excellent fisheries work. But this is invariably still just a snapshot of what things look like today in this present time of dams overfishing, pollution, invasive species, and habitat loss. What did it look like before? How do I embed a longer term view and in indigenous worldviews, knowledge and ways of knowing into this work and into my thesis? So I chartered into more um, uncharted waters and I built a part of my research program that would now focus on indigenous knowledge of Pacific salmon and perceptions of threats to these fish by speaking with respected knowledge keepers and communities across BC, elders who live not only along the Nass River, but also along the Skeena and the Fraser. In the summer of 2018, I visited with 50 elders between their mid fifties and mid nineties, who shared with me the knowledge of, of generations, comparing the way things are now to how they were when they were young, to how they were in their parents' time, their grandparents' time, and in some cases, uh, well beyond that. And in all cases, these were conversations that grew well beyond fish. I spent time in each community. I solo camped the, the whole summer long. I spent a week at an elder youth culture camp. I visited traditional fishing grounds. I met with elders inside smoke houses, um, had some recordings in the middle of pouring rain. I had one interview on a four wheeler and another on a canoe. I drank an incredible amount of tea and ate meals and was graciously invited into their homes and their lives. I was building a thesis that ascribed to the Mi'kmaq notion of Etiwaptamuk or two-eyed seeing, which is, means learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledges and ways of knowing, and learning to use both these eyes together for the benefit of all. And this is a concept that originated in Unamagi or Cape Breton, and it was formalized by Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall in 2004 in the science education literature. And it's gone on to be applied in, in forestry, mining, health research quite prominently, and now within fisheries. Knowledge generation does not need to be an either or proposition. It can be both, it can be multi-paradigmatic. We do not need to shoehorn indigenous paradigms into science to make it relevant to fisheries managers or decision makers. It can be about bringing knowledges and ways of knowing together through true collaboration and mutual understanding. This is a time of crisis and we need the best tools available at our disposal. So what am I finding through this work? Um, well, it, it's complex, but I'll boil it down just big picture. Bycatch fish are indeed making it upstream, but not all. Injury is appearing to be the biggest predictor of who makes it to spawning grounds versus who doesn't. Working with my community and other nations in my ecological research was game-changing for my ability to monitor fish and be confident in my findings. 
a really neat tool that's employed by the Niska Fisheries and Wildlife Department are these things called fish wheels that are kind of like Ferris wheels for fish powered by the river's current. They scoop up fish and water from the river together so the fish can breathe and drops them into a basket that technicians monitor and they can remove fish one at a time using a dip net and they can identify the species of fish, they can measure it, tag it, sample it, um, and in my case, uh, check the, the tag number on these fish before returning the fish to the water so that they can continue along their migration. So this ground truths my radio telemetry data through physical recaptures of these fish. Turning our gaze now to the elders, they noted significant changes in the fish, their numbers, their condition, behavior, changes in the water itself, its flow, even its smell. As one elder put it, if the north wind was blowing down the river and we were coming up, we could smell the salmon in the air. We could smell the salmon. You drink the river water and you can taste the salmon in the river. Wow. But they also commented on its safety. Despite my not asking any specific questions about this, most elders highlighted how they used to be able to drink straight from the river and how now they never could. In some places, elders feel compelled to even wash their hands after touching the river for concern for what's in the water. I asked elders what youth could do to help secure a future for our fish. And one of the most common recommendations was completely unexpected by me at the time. It now seems abundantly obvious, but it was that youth learn their language. The thinking being that by learning the language, we're connecting to culture. And this implies an understanding and care for the fish. But this also works in the opposite direction. So in areas where access to salmon has become limited, Elders are deeply concerned for how youth are going to learn the cultural practices and the language that are tied to the fish. In specific cases, elders shared concern over communities now being given fish that are being obtained non-traditionally from fish fences, for example, because they fear what this will do and is doing to the linked traditions and knowledges. The government decided they're going to ruin us by giving salmon to us instead of us setting net for it. They're catching them down there at the fence and giving it to us. Would you like it if I just handed you the fish and said, here, you don't have to go and get it? That's very, very, very bad business for the whole community. Nobody's learning how to do the fish. It's kind of the reverse of that old adage of teach a person to fish. What happens when you take that fish away? Where does the learning and knowledge go? The second main answer to this question was that youth spend time on the land, something that I'm going to circle back to at the end. So this brings me to the, the third and, and last part of my talk, recognizing and respecting more than one worldview, which immediately gets people asking logistical questions about how to operationalize this idea, how to go about carrying out this work in the so-called right way. And fortunately, the challenge in this realm is less about method. It's far more about creating space, enabling dialogue, and promoting equality. And fortunately, there's a wealth of guidance here on how to do this research in the right way. Um, so a couple of examples, but I'm happy again to recommend more, uh, include Sean Wilson's Research is Ceremony, which outlines what it looks like to do work that is respectful, relational, reciprocal, relational accountability, as it's called. Linda Tuhiwai Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies provides the foundations for much of what I've shared here today. And there's also the First Nations Information Governance Center uh, who has developed OCAP, the set of standards that establish how First Nations data should be owned, controlled, accessed, and possessed in Canada. All of these works guided my approaches to doing my work in the right way, from how I obtained consent from elders and nations to participate in my work, to what I offered to them um, in return as honoraria and gifts, to how I ensured that they retained control of their knowledge through shared copyright. The methods exist. It's more how we create the space that's needed. That is the bigger question. So I'm going to revisit these core four concepts that define paradigms. What we need is a fisheries ontology that is relativist and relational, that recognizes that multiple socially constructed realities exist at the same time. What you see as truth as a manager or a wreck fisher, they might be very different from an indigenous fisher's truth, 
but not any of them need to be viewed as wrong or mutually exclusive. Adopting an inclusive approach will allow us to bring together the multiple worldviews that truly exist in a single system, instead of prescribing policy based on a single worldview that simply is not gonna fit everyone's reality. We need a fisheries epistemology that expands what we count as knowledge to include that which is derived experientially and relationally, we're only gonna strengthen our fisheries by recognizing that there is value in indigenous fisheries paradigms that encompasses baseline fish and fisheries data, early observation of, of change, dynamic understandings of ecosystem and organismal function that can inform our present day strategies, practices, perspectives. We need a fisheries axiology that values relational accountability that promotes respectful representation and reciprocity. Local buy-in has time and again been shown to be critical in the uptake of conservation action in fisheries, bring fishers on board or miss the boat, so to speak. But how can we expect buy-in without relational accountability? And finally, we need a fisheries methodology that is participatory, where research policy and management are co-developed, co-run, and co-evaluated, where actions are not confined to consideration for a single generation and are contextualized and localized and not so broad as to be indiscriminate and not place-based. In sum, we need a fisheries worldview that is fundamentally two-eyed. So I have my work cut out for me as I continue to, to build space for this way of thinking at universities through teaching and in our practices as researchers. So on this broader issue of creating space, dialogue and equality at universities, we need to start by promoting inclusivity. Who can sit on you know, student advisory committees? Can it be an elder? Who can serve as an external examiner? Can it be a respected knowledge keeper? How do we track faculty contributions to their disciplines and elevate members to, to tenure? Is it through publications alone or can outreach time and community and, and these kinds of measures count for something? How do we make campuses more welcoming to all peoples, especially given the history between educational institutions and indigenous peoples on this continent, which is difficult to say the least. As we come closer to UNDRIP being legislated federally, we may face a very different future whereby universities would be violating this international code of conduct if they promote solely a Western paradigm to the exclusion of all others. Answers to these questions are therefore in need of urgent attention and they are just the start. So coming back to these two questions that put me down the, the path that I now recognize I need to be on, how does my work matter to my community? Well, now I center my community at the heart of my work. They care, they care tremendously about what I'm finding about our fish and fisheries. And when I landed my position at, at UBC, they wrote a, a whole article featuring the news and I'm regularly invited to, to give talks in our schools and our nation to present to our government, to share my findings with our fish and wildlife department. And two years ago, I was named an education role model in my village. As for how I give back to my community in line with what the elders call for, I focus my efforts on that next generation, leading annual science camps for youth in my nation uh, with my partner, John Francis. And as uh, Aaron introduced, I've started a, a not-for-profit and charitable organization called Riparia with two friends and colleagues that connects diverse youth with learning opportunities on the water and much of this in partnership with National Geographic. and. Hopefully, when we have a post-COVID world, we are looking to expand our operations beyond. Right now, we're focused in Quebec, but we're hoping to bring some of these experiences to BC. Having answers to these questions is not a box checking exercise for me, and I'm not trying to talk myself up. It is just about me waking up to the need for this kind of work that centers community in my research that is respectful and reciprocal. And so I'd just like to close by dedicating this talk uh, to the elder on the right, Niska elder James Adams, who passed away not too long ago. And he's one of several elders that have passed away since I led this work. There's a, a real urgency that underlies this work as indigenous knowledge keepers and, and fluent speakers become fewer and fewer. If we don't change how we're doing things now, we might lose our opportunity altogether. And so 
with that, I'd like to thank you for, for your attention and time today um, and close by giving the, the final words uh, to artist Christy Belcourt. And so it began during the time of climate change when people began to rise up like David against Goliath. Standing up to in industry monsters, they boarded ships and dismantled fish farms. They declared laws unjust and shook their rattles and sang, the rivers belong to the salmon. And so I'll just end by sharing some contact info. Do feel free to, to get in touch and I'd be happy to, to take questions or, or hear your comments and thoughts. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. I um, really appreciate all of your thoughts. Um, I just want to make sure everybody knows, because I don't even think I said this, you can submit your questions in the chat today. Um, and um, that would be the the best way. Otherwise, um, Karina, I'll ask you to look out for if folks want to use the reactions emoji um, to raise your hand. Um, we might be able to actually have people unmute themselves if we don't have too many. Um, but I just wanted to kind of kick us off. I really appreciate you saying a research doesn't happen in a vacuum. And I think that even if some of us aren't in research directly, we could easy, easily replace that with um, whatever we do it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I appreciate a lot of the lessons I think about like land conservation, natural resource management, education, um, community or citizen science, even water quality monitoring. Um, and then how you close with ensuring that work is respectful and reciprocal, I think is a huge important takeaway for all of us. Um, I'm seeing some really positive comments in the chat. Um, I wondered if I could ask you about um, the concept of resilience, um, because that's a word and kind of mission or goal we hear a lot in coastal work, and many of us are involved in Lake Superior coastal work. Um, I've heard one argument that we should frame resilience as bouncing forward, not bouncing back, um, because bouncing back may not be what many communities want to do. They may want to look more future forward. And when you mentioned how you prefer, um, I think you said you prefer to focus on indigenizing, not decolonizing. It reminded me of that, bouncing forward, not back. And so I wonder if in your work, how you deal with the language of resilience, that concept, and maybe how you talk about it. Yeah, yeah, great questions and thoughts, Erin. Um, on the note of decolonizing and indigenizing too, one thing I, I didn't mention is that, I mean, a lot of the scholarship in this space really positions decolonization as, as the work that needs to be done by non-Indigenous folks. Mm -hmm. And indigenization is the like the cell celebration piece, the getting to revive these cultures and, and to, yeah, celebrate their strengths. Um, on the notion of resilience, I mean, I hear, I also hear concerns around this word at times, right, because it, it's something that is often raised and touted for Indigenous populations, but it, it feels like it kind of flies in the face of, well, we, we've had to be resilient if we are to still exist through the colonial process of, of North American colonization. Um, and so I know for many, it can be kind of a, a tense term because there's no choice in, in the matter. It is a beautiful word and I like it in certain contexts, but I, I have not made up my mind about it um, completely. I think that absolutely nations, I mean, they're all indigenous cultures are distinct from one another and what different communities or populations might want is for them to decide. So I'm just all for self-determination in those contexts. Some might want to bounce back and to revive, you know, traditional ways and stick to them. Others might want to be, you know, fully modern and not thinking about those old ways. And I think that that is, that is up to them and their choice. Um, Diane asked about where we'll share the link today. Um, yes, this, this is being recorded and um, Diane, as soon as we have it captioned, um, you'll get a, a note um, about where it's gonna live on the Lake Superior Reserves site um, and the collaborative YouTube page. So we, we gotta get it captioned first, but then um, once it's ready, we'll let you know. Um, and it will be open to anyone at that point, not just those who are registered today. Um, I think that's right, Karina, correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, 
Let's see. I was just going to chime in to add to that. I appreciate people's flexibility and understanding this talk was advertised as one centered on land-based learning, which was my intent. Uh, but then some things have happened this past week that just made it impossible for me to get there in time. So last minute pivot to this focus, but um, I hope that it, it resonated with some of the themes that you're already covering in this, in this series. Definitely. And would you mind if we, when we follow up with folks today, um, would you mind if we shared, I have two, um, written pieces by Andrea and partners, um, including your two wide seeing indigenous framework to transform fisheries research and management article. And then um, the second one would be the 20 essential reads to enable two eyed seeing in aquatic research and management, which is a, um, as it sounds kind of a, a recommended reading list, or we could we could share that out with folks after if you're all right with that. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Yep. Okay. I am seeing a hand up. Let me see if I can find you. Uh, Courtney, do you want to unmute and just ask your question? Yes. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed the talk today. I work at the Environmental Institute at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. And so I am, you know, getting a lot of students at the beginning of what they're trying to figure out what they want to do. And, you know, when we get them into research, uh, we want to support them exploring just what you were saying, um, uh, you know, approaching science while grounded in their community. And, uh, you know, we've done this several different ways, but I'd be interested in hearing some ways maybe that you have supported incoming college students in order to give them a grounding in research, indigenous, indigenous inclusive research. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful question. I'm happy to hear about your your position as well. Um, I I mean, for a lot of the work that I do and the the group that I'm building at UBC is a majority Indigenous team, and the entire purpose of the Center for Indigenous Research is to be responsive to community needs and interests. And so, right now, with the launch of our center and and my appointment at the university, there's been a, a kind of a tidal wave of interest on the part of communities. And so I've been meeting steadily with nations to have meetings about strategy and be forward looking and thinking through where this work is going to take us. But fisheries in particular on on the north coast on the on the west coast of, of Canada, um, and especially in the northwest where where my nation is, I mean, Fisheries are just, they're so pivotal and central to identity that the connection for communities with fisheries, it's just, it's just really automatic in that space. Um, but from my work in playing more of a mentor role as a graduate student and now in my in my current position, I think it's really important that that students have the agency to, to make clear what they want to be doing because I think in many cases it needs to feel okay that some students don't want to do things that are community oriented, kind of that same response I just gave to Aaron that I think it's great if there are certain students that want to do, you know, Western science, they want to be a medical doctor in that contemporary sense and go down that path, that is fantastic. And if they do want to engage in community based work with their community or with others, to me, that always begins with relationships and with conversations. And so right now, those meetings I'm having with all these different nations are centered on just building up that, that trust and understanding what the needs and interests are. And then I'm doing the same thing with prospective students and kind of matching them to those projects. And more often than not, the Indigenous students I'm I'm advising are working in their home territories, but not, not always. And I think that it's an interesting kind of dynamic to watch unfold, because I think the expectation is that like, yes, of course, you're going to work in your home community, but I don't think that's always where people want to be. Um, yeah, so I hope that answered your question, but I, I appreciate your thought. And I'd love to hear if you had any, any thoughts back to me. Oh, thank you very much. That's um, that's a really thoughtful response, and, and, and that's something we've been thinking about, too, as we do it. Um, and just kind of grounding them, introduce, you know, just what is ethical research, you know, what does that mean to their community and to them, and then, and then uh, before they launch them into the world. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that, that's super well said, because I think for many, it's not about changing 
it can be about changing the scientific process, but for many, it's not. It's about like the ethics we apply around that. It's about respectful engagement first and foremost. Um, and yeah, I think a really important piece too is just connecting to that broader network, that growing network of you know aces and getting to see that there are indigenous people in science. Because I think from the outset, you know, science is so discipline focused and not really holistic or conducive to thinking interdisciplinarily. And so having those young people see themselves in, in those leaders, I think can be really meaningful. And ACES has wonderful seminar series. They have things that are more youth oriented or oriented towards young professionals. So definitely recommend checking them out. Thank you. And um, thanks Sienna for putting the ACES link in the chat. Um, I know the ACES program at the engineering focused school I went to for graduate school was really important to those students who were a part of it. Um, let's see, I think that, oh, um, what, uh, Juno asked, would you also be willing to post the artist's name? So maybe Andrea, we can, Karina and I can get that information from you and share it in our follow-up um, contacts with folks. Um, yeah, one thing I'll I'll just add on on her front. So Christy Belcourt, I'll I'll pass on the information. But um, some of the artwork that I shared in like the the protest um, image where people were holding these water is life signs and that kind of thing. Those are also made by the artist and her and another um, artist partner. Um, Isaac Murdoch, uh, the two of them have this collective called the Onaman Collective, where they make all of those prints freely available for educational use, for, for whatever it might be. And they're beautiful and you can get them printed as silk screens or, or whatever you like. Great, thank you. I think I found the website. So I'm gonna put that in the chat um, right now. So let's see, I saw that Deanna posted a question and we just have a couple minutes left. Deanna, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Yeah. And is there any more questions? Because I don't want to, I don't want to nope. take, okay. Um, Andrea, I think one of the things that people often struggle with in trying, trying to have the perspectives to see through both eyes is the relationships, you know, the world that any individual lives in, they look out and they might not see the indigenous knowledge that's everywhere. And you know, do you have any advice for folks in this audience on on finding that or on building relationships that are that are um, equitable and uh, good? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a really nice way of phrasing it. Just the other day, I was reading this paper that uh, it leads with "Do berries listen?" and a team and I were dissecting it and thinking about it, and it was a challenging piece for some people to have an understanding and appreciation of these indigenous cultures talking about berries listening and talking back and how can we navigate that as western scientists and with these trainings that we have and um, I think it's a really interesting thing to to think through ultimately in this work what I have found is just that it, it's about doing this work like in in a good way of being respectful of taking time to listen I think that if we walk into these spaces with the intent of just taking knowledge out of context and putting it into a, a Western science framework, like that's automatically going to convey ideas of, you know, that that knowledge held isn't valid, that it needs to be transformed, translated, shrunk, so it can fit within this Western science framework. If that's not the attitude we take, I think if we treat that knowledge with validity as evidence in and of its own right, I think that that is a really wonderful point of entry for, for many people. Um, but some of the books I referenced, particularly um, particularly Sean Wilson's research is Ceremony, but another book that I think is on the 20 essential reads reading list, but I'd have to verify, um, Margaret Kovach's Indigenous Methodologies is a really, really wonderful, thoughtful guide through a lot of these conversations. I took a photo of that screen. <laughs> Thank okay. you. And yeah, that book, that book is on the list. I just took, I peeked at it. So it, it's on the 20, um, the 20 reads. Um, I wanna make sure I am respectful of your time. Um, 
And I guess we need to, to wrap up here, but thank you so much for joining our series and being a part of it. I wanted to give a plug to um, the Great Lakes Research Conference. I know Dr. Reed, you have a session you've co-organized with folks and there will be multiple days of this sort of discussion and, um, and more perspective. So if any of you have a chance to register for and attend the Great Lakes Research Conference this year, um, we can kind of continue the conversation there. So I'm really happy. Thank that you for being on the ball. Yes, we're hosting a three day session on bridging knowledge systems. It was intended to just be a day, but there was overwhelming interest on the part of nations and tribes. And so there's tons of people presenting, which is going to be really exciting and includes a, a panel, also an open dialogue session. So community members can come and share without, you know, having to register or having to create a PowerPoint, they can just come speak. So it's going to be a, a good couple of days. But thank you, Erin, for, for plugging that. Thank you all for your attention and time today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>